One Million Cups is a weekly educational program developed by the Kauffman Foundation. Over the years, we've added more cities. It creates a great energy here to see what's happening across the country. What I've learned from other entrepreneurs is very, very valuable. Sitting in a room with other people that have ideas too, it helps people to leave thinking, you know what? My idea is worth something. It's worth pursuing. It's worth going after it. Even if it looks like a challenge, I should still go out and try to do it. Good morning. Good morning. All right, welcome to One Million Cups. I'm one of the organizers. I'm Milton. I'm here with Brian, Toby, and Britton. Um, today, we're going to do something a little bit different. Um, for those of you that are here for the first time, let me at least explain what One Million Cups is. It's an educational program designed by the Kauffman Foundation. Typically, we bring in uh, two entrepreneurs. They come and tell their story for about six minutes, then we open it up to the audience for a QA. and a um, today, uh, we're doing our Tough Decisions panel, and we also have an alumni presenter that's going to come and give us an update as to where they are now type of thing from their, their previous uh, presentation here. So let me ask this question. Who's here for the first time today? Welcome. Sure. Round of applause. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, can I see of hands of some of our veteran 1MCers? All right, we've got a few here. Well, well welcome to all of you today. Um, to get the show started, we are actually gonna bring up John Ruiz from EB Systems. They use apps and Bluetooth beacons to make companies more efficient. He's gonna tell us uh, kind of where he's been and where he's going. Let's hear it for John. Is this thing on? Hi there. Hey everyone, uh, my name is John Ruiz. I'm the CEO of EB Systems. Uh, this is actually my third time presenting at One Million Cups. Uh, so today I'm just gonna update you on some lessons I've learned since the last time we presented. Uh, back then the company was actually called eBeacons Public Safety Services. Uh, we were going to make the world safer using mobile apps. We wanted to put a panic button in the pocket of every student and citizen so they could easily reach emergency services. And back then there was a lot of excitement around this idea. Uh, we had landed some pretty big pilot projects. We had investors who were interested and you know, ready to give us some money. Uh, and usually in the entrepreneurial life, when everything is going good, that's when something wrong happens. And that's exactly what did happen. Uh, first off, some of the target markets we were involved in uh, were just taking too long. You know, the sales cycle was dragging on. Four weeks turned into four months. And there really wasn't any resolution in sight. Uh, secondly, the investors were just starting to lose interest. You know, they were wondering, you know, when is a university going to pay you? How long is that going to take? What if the app doesn't work? We're going to get sued and all that investment money is going to be gone. And lastly, what it came down to was, you know what, get someone to pay you for this first and then come and talk to us about investment. So at that time as well, my current uh, technical partner unfortunately had to leave the company. You know, student loan payments were looming and he had to go get a job. Uh, so my current business partner and I took a step back and we needed to make a change. So we, uh, we did the fabled pivot and we had to pivot. Uh, so we had some exciting pilots lined up, but we decided to focus on a pilot we had secured with a private security company for a couple reasons, mainly because there's one CEO, one decision maker, and one person who signs the check. And luckily, the CEO of the company that we were working with was, al was also a mentor of ours. So we went to him, and quite frankly, we asked him, look, what would you pay for? What would you pay us for? Uh, at this point, we're kind of yes men. We're trying to figure out how can we get this thing launched. You know, we talked about it, and we all agreed that giving his clients a panic button uh, to call security guards may not be the best route. You know, there could be someone who cries wolf 10 times a day, and it's just added work for his employees. So we landed on this concept of mobile workforce management. Essentially, the security officers would use the mobile app to check into patrol points and show that they made it to their work sites. Also, the company was still doing paper reports. So we made them completely paperless. They filled out uh, reports using the mobile app. We gave them a database. And lastly, we were able to add a revenue stream in the form of a client portal. Now his clients can view all their data in real time and it's just an added level of service and they could also upcharge for that. So after landing on this concept, uh, you know, he said, yes, I'll pay for it. He signed the contract. Then we called up the investors. 
And now that we had a paying client, you know, they wanted to talk to us again. They were very interested. Uh, and so we went back to them and we were able to, to secure 10 different angel investors with 10 different investment packages and it'd be over a six figure seed round. So we're young men, 23 year olds, you know, that's big money for us, so we're really excited. Uh, so we go into the, uh, I guess, finalization meeting or whatever, and I don't know if these guys just got done watching a Shark Tank marathon or what, because <laughs> they tore us apart. They tore us apart. You know, they were just, it was batting practice. One guy would throw up a softball like, hey, Bob, didn't you talk to your buddy out in the valley? Uh, they said it was a little risky. We need at least double the equity, right? And you'd be like, oh, yeah, yeah, we're, we're going to need some more equity. And, you know, that client you got, we're going to need a royalty on that every month. And so we're sitting here and we're thinking, well, we got the money. You know, we got, you know, a six-figure check coming our way. But these guys wanted almost half the company and they wanted a quarter of our monthly revenues. So we took a step back and we decided, all right, we don't need these guys. We got a client. Let's do this thing on our own. So we looked at our options and we decided to only take on one of the investors who had 30 years IT experience and also was willing to work with me to program the back end and the uh, database. So really we still needed a mobile developer, so we decided to use a piece of equity to partner with a mobile platform company here in town, Moblico Solutions. So not only were we able to get a, a production ready mobile app, but we also had discounted continued uh, customer service. So really, we had our MVP, and we were launched, and we were making money. So I'm not going to stand up here and act like you know we got rich overnight. This was about seven or eight months ago, but since then, you know we got real traction in the form of a paying client. And so some of my advice to the entrepreneurs out there, you know, just a quick piece of advice, especially here in Kansas City, in the Midwest, you know, we're not on the coasts. It's a different climate here as far as business and how things go. So focus on making money before you worry about taking money, okay? People get lost in the flashing lights of big investment rounds and you know, getting bought out before they even figure out how are we gonna get started and how are we gonna start generating revenue. Getting a paying client is the best thing you can do because it opens doors, especially to investors here in KC who are more risk adverse, they wanna see traction, but also you're making money. You know, we can use that to hire people, we're developing intellectual property and we're able to expand to you know, high growth markets. So on that note, uh, you know, for q and I just wanna tee it up, you know, ask me about our business, what we're doing, some of the exciting markets we're in. Also too, you know, if you're a young entrepreneur, you know, I have a lot of experience with that here in Kansas City, so ask me about some of my experiences. And also too, I would like to start emerging as a community leader and a thought leader and, I actually kind of dawned on me that my dream job would be to be the uh, chief innovation officer of Kansas City, Missouri. So feel free to ask me some general questions about the innovation landscape here in Kansas City. I'll get my politician hat on and try and answer them as best I can. So on that note, I guess I can go to questions. Uh, John, thank you. We will open it up to the audience for questions. Um, I'd like to maybe start with one kind of more about that meeting that you went into with those yeah. uh, <laughs> sharks, right? So more a question of advice, like what would you tell other entrepreneurs that have to go into a meeting like that looking to raise capital? They're staring at some potential equity partners. They're sure. saying we're going to give you money, but then they change the game like when you walk in the room. Right, right. So no matter how easy it seems, Getting a rich person to give away their money is not easy at all, okay? <laughs> and it's probably one of the hardest things that you can do. So the first things first, especially in Kansas City, is have your, your plan set out to grow and scale the company. You know, the big picture ideas and the big picture pitch is valuable and you have to make that pitch. But when it gets down to getting that money, you need to be very clear about what you're gonna use that money for and how it's gonna accelerate your growth. I think a lot of people get lost in you know, hey, this, this is a billion dollar idea, I only need a million bucks to get it off the ground. Well, that's not, that's not uh, that doesn't really sit well with any investor. So just really get focused and make sure you're clear about what you're gonna use the money on, is what I would say. Got a question, question in the middle? Hey John, thanks. Uh, quick question to you. You mentioned, uh, I see in your slides here, home health. Sure. Could you share a little bit more about what that is? So we landed on this concept of workforce management, right? Uh, so we started looking at where can we add the most value to certain companies. So a big issue and pain point that we saw in home healthcare was 
you know, just fraud and accountability. You know, are they showing up? Are they spending enough time with patients, et cetera? So really, we're able to accomplish a system that reduces fraud using a mobile app, and we're using this really exciting technology. They're called Bluetooth beacons. Essentially, it's a little lighthouse, right? You can set the radius up to 100 meters or down to touching, and based on that radius, we can trigger interactions in the app. So in home health, we can track when the uh, in-house in nurse walked in the door, when they walked out for their time clock. We can also use strate strategically placed beacons around the home to see when they fed the patient, when they bathed the patient, when they gave them their medicines. So really we're helping you know, compliance and, and helping reduce fraud is what we're really trying to accomplish there. Got a question here in the middle. It's great to hear your evolution. Tell me, what um, has kept you from giving up on the business? Well, uh, to be honest, once you really get into the entrepreneur swing of things, it's, it's kind of an addiction, right? I, I just can't let it go. Uh, I just, I just got to keep going, and I, I see what's happening in my hometown, and I see the people around me, and I know that there's something here. And, you know, I'm a young man. Uh, I, sometimes I feel like an old man, but I'm, I'm 24 years old. Uh, so I feel like, you know, here's, here's my shot to, to chase the dream you know, while I'm still young and in a kind of ripe environment here in Kansas City. So, uh, you know, it's going to take a lot for me to, to go away. I think it was three, almost three years ago I presented first for One Million Cups, and I'm still here. So I think it just kind of speaks a lot for this community and what's going on here. Congratulations on your presentation and all your evolution. And, try, and also, I have to admit, staring down the sharks. <laughs> yeah. But one of my, in all seriousness, I would love to see hear about your marketing strategy and how you incorporate social media and also digital e marketing as well. Sure. So honestly, that's I was just literally just talking to my uh, business partner about this five minutes ago. Social media marketing is in our focus right now, uh, and we're kind of weak in that aspect. So really, most of our marketing efforts are coming through organic leads. So through my journey here in Kansas City, I've met a lot of people and rubbed elbows with some powerful folks. And just through our organic leads, we've been able to uh, you know, meet new clients and enter new industries organically. I think our next step is gonna be, you know, we're looking at a way to develop either, a, uh, either an online marketing uh, plan, uh, directed marketing towards business owners or we're looking into maybe developing a, a phone or a, a telemarketing plan. So, you know, our budget's still a little, a little thin. We can't throw a bunch of money at marketing right now. We're focusing more on product development, uh, but we'll get there. Got one here in the front, John. Hi, John. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the relationship with the mobile um, team that you said that you partnered with. And I guess because you used the word partnered, but shortly after you talked about taking just a little bit of um, angel investment, I think sure. you said, from one investor, was it just a work for hire um, cash based partnership, or did you um, have some sort of work for hire plus equity relationship with that mobile company? So the latter. Uh, so, really, you know, we we needed the mobile app, you know, myself and our uh, angel partner were able to program some of the back end stuff, but really on the mobile side of things, we couldn't do it all, and the mobile company, it was a cash and equity, uh, you know, deal, but really we got it at a fraction of some of the other quotes we were getting from, you know, companies here in town. Also, it was production ready, you know, a development project that would have taken six months or so was, uh, shrunk down to six weeks and we were able to deliver to that client and start getting that money in the door. So that was, that was our goal there and that was our vision there. And, it, and I mean, it was a great partnership. I think it was one of our best decisions. <laughs> Question here in the front. Yeah, great job for where you're at today. Um, now that you have a growing business, how, um, what's your strategy on staying focused on what your core clients, uh, who they are and not to get distracted by other uh, side businesses or side markets. Right, right. So it's we're in an interesting space because, you know, mobile workforces, you know, every workforce is going to be mobile, right? Uh, so really what's kind of differentiating us and what's allowing us to enter some of these markets is, uh, you know, we quickly became experts on the Bluetooth beacon technology. You know, we can, I can confidently say that myself and our team, we're, you know, we're beacon experts and we can do consulting based on this technology and really, our expertise allows us to enter some of these markets. 
essentially we're using the same technology, the same platform, but just with small tweaks, you know, I always tell our new clients or people we talk to, our solution is always 90% done. That last 10% will just come through interfacing and things of that nature. So really our strategy is just to keep empowering the, uh, the core of our platform, which is mobile apps and this beacon technology and just grow from there. That one up front. Um, I think one of the biggest struggles for entrepreneurs is the timeline from launch to profit to explosion. Sure. Can you talk a little bit about the launch? You said you lost one of your, your technical partners. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about what that timeline was from launch to profit and now where you are? So really, from the time I lost my technical partner, that was about a year and a half ago. And so, you know, the, the biggest challenge there was, you know, I had already spent six to seven months, you know, trying to find pilot partners and signing pilot partners at the same time, engaging these investors and, you know, trying to raise money. Then all of a sudden, you know, he leaves and I was left with this sense of, you know, what, what did I just do for the past, you know, year? Did I waste my time, et cetera? So it takes a lot to kind of get back on the horse and realize that all the things you've done aren't wasted if you hit a failure or a roadblock. So from there, you know, the timeline went from, you know, instead of focusing on trying to raise a bunch of money and hire a bunch of people, we just focused on, all right, how do we get this thing as lean as possible to deliver to our first paying client and then just go from there? I think that's, you just gotta be focused on getting that first dollar, I feel like, instead of the buyout or the big investment. Question here to your right. So you've had a crazy journey, you've been through the ringer. Um, and one of the things that we've been talking about a lot recently is failure. And honestly, I, I kind of am in the opinion that has gone a little bit too far of almost uh, seeking failure instead of just accepting it. Um, and I'm, I'm curious, do you acknowledge failure in your journey or is it just something that you deflect off of and, and, and strive towards success? Uh, you know, it's definitely something I acknowledge. You know, before this venture, uh, throughout college, I always had a harebrained scheme. I was trying to get off the ground. and. I never, <laughs> none of them re never really took off, you know. Uh, so I've failed a bunch of times, and you know, really, the the best part of failure is you learn so much. Uh, you know, if I would have given up after like my co-founder left, or you know, after the investors, you know, kind of told me to buzz off for the first time, then you know, we I wouldn't have learned some of the things and made the decisions that you know ultimately led to our success. I have a question in the middle, in the back. So specifically looking at home health care, mm -hmm. but any of your um, projects or target populations that you have here, have you done any market research with the end user, the people that are actually going to be using this? And right. to, because it, it feels a little bit big brother, sure. you know, and my mother works in home health care. Uh -huh. And so I'm just curious if there's a there's another opportunity that maybe you could um, refine this this product to be a little bit more, um, I don't know, in service to the the user rather than it being about watching them, so, helping, you know, and framing it in a way that maybe is a little bit more about having work-life balance and actually providing more compassionate care um, and more effective security, you sure. know, in that way. So that's definitely our goal. You know, we realize that, you know, workforce management and employee tracking, you know, there's some negative connotations to that. And that's something that we see in, you know, all of our interactions with potential clients or current clients. You know, really, when we first started developing this project, yeah, we went directly, you know, to the CEO of our security company, but most of our time spent was with the operations manager, the dispatchers, and the actual, you know, security officers to see how can we make your life easier? You know, and all of, you know, and we talk to, you know, home healthcare workers and some of the things that challenges them. And that's what we do. That's how we develop our product. You know, we can go to the boss and tell them, hey, this, does this sound good? Will you pay for it? But really, you know, we have to interact with the people that are actually using the app. And that's something that we're very focused on and we're very keen of. And we've learned more from just doing a ride along with the security officer than sitting in the CEO's office. And we, see a lot of value in that. Got a question to your right here in the back. Morning, Jonathan. Hey, what's going on, man? Is there 
are there any organizations around Kansas City that have helped you at pivotal times in your business or supported you in ways that you didn't expect or are there any, any you could just give a shout out to? Sure, uh, so I was, during most of this time, I was an entrepreneurship scholar student at UMKC. So a really great organization, got a lot of great feedback, a lot of great mentorship. You know, initially they're the ones that told me that maybe trying to tackle, you know, saving the world with the touch of a button may not be the best thing for a startup. Uh, so that was a very key lesson and a lot of those mentors turn into potential investors or potential, uh, you know, we're, we're doing some, uh, we're getting leads from our, you know, mentor network and things of that nature. And, you know, the way we started, you know, I, it's kind of like the storybook story, right? I was a UMKC entrepreneurship student. I was taking coding classes over at Kauffman Labs. Uh, I met my first co-founder at Startup Weekend. I pitched at One Million Cups at the Google Fiber space. You know, it was just, it was a great experience and it was a great introduction to this community. So I wouldn't be here if I wasn't in Kansas City, I'll say that for sure. Got a question to your left. Oh. Uh, knowing what you know now and what it took to get here, what's your uh, long-term plan for this company? So like five, 10, 15 years down the road? So honestly, right now our focus is on just scaling up. Uh, we see the we're in a B2B industry, you know, so there's gonna be some time to really get to a point where we're operating where I want, you know. Yeah, there's always the shining light of the big buyout down the road, but honestly, I think our focus right now and our positioning is let's grow the company, let's create some jobs here locally and see where that takes us. Uh, we would like to interface with some of the bigger Kansas City companies and see if we can create some of those relationships to strengthen ourselves in uh, different markets. So, you know, right now it's all focused on growth. We're not really thinking of an exit strategy at this point. Obviously, if one comes our way, we're going to have to consider it and see if it's worth it. But at this point, we're just focused on growing the company here in town and creating jobs. Got a question to your right here in the back. Good morning, Jonathan. Morning. You mentioned earlier that you'd like to be the chief innovation officer for Kansas City. Yes. In a nutshell, what would your first project be? Well... <laughs> Honestly, my first focus and project would be uh, empowering urban youth. I think that's a huge problem we have in Kansas City. People like to act like East of Truce doesn't exist. It's getting neglected as far as innovation goes. So I feel like the first thing's first. You know, you're not going to solve poverty and crime, you know, with a mobile app. But you can, you know, plant the seeds with some of the younger kids, get them interested in technology and programming and things of that nature. And, empower them to, uh, to help the, their, their community around them. I think that's something that, you know, that kind of inspires me since I'm a, minor, I'm a minority myself, I'm a young person, and I can relate to some of these kids over there that you know, feel, like, feel a little hopeless or that the, there's nothing going on around them. So that's where my focus would be, is innovating more in the urban core. I have a question to your left, John. Hello. So congratulations on being cash flow. Yeah, thank you. And my question to you is, are you ready to go after the big whale federal contracts? Well, I mean... And I, I asked that question in a context. I spent about a year on the Gulf Coast okay. after Katrina with FEMA contractors sure. in the Gulf Coast in New Orleans. A big problem was tracking all the workers in the high-risk area that they were working in. And if something was wrong, how do they know and get help out to them? Sure. So making that jump, military. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, it takes time to get a federal contract, and that's why I started with congratulations on having a current cash flow. Sure, sure. So yeah, I mean, the big fish are always attractive, and we're interacting with some big fish right now. Uh, so it goes back to a focus thing. You know, we can have those big fish in our back pocket, but the sales cycle is always going to be long, so we have to manage our time. You know, we have very distinct kind of targets. We have big fish, and then we have, you know, clients and companies that, you know, will essentially pay the bills and help grow the company. So really our focus right now is just time management, but we're, we're not shy with the big fish. You know, our, our angel that we ended up bringing on, he is just like, you know, me and my business partner, he, he, he says we're, we, there's so many meetings that we go into that we're not nervous about that we should be with some big and powerful people. And I think that's one of our biggest strengths is we're not afraid of, you know, talking to some of the big fish. Yeah. 
question here in the middle. Hi, great presentation, Chris from Thanks, St. Pete, One Million Cups. Um, you told your story about starting specifically on, you know, having that emergency button. Mm -hmm. So it was mm -hmm. a very specific, you know, focused utility, focused application. Sure. And then your story, if, and if I'm correct, started to gravitate towards where can we get a paying client around sure. beacon technology. And then your presentation seems more of a, you know, we're consultants and we could do healthcare, we could do construction, whatever. Mm -hmm. Do you feel um, that you've got away now from a focus of, uh, you know, one particular application that a competitor tomorrow can come out and say we're beacon technology for construction? And sure. I mean, do you, are you happy with the decision to go more of a, let's just find the money and find which consulting project well, is going to work? Or, or are you trying to then come back to and focus on a singular so you know, to, to that end, you know, it wasn't necessarily about going for the money. It was, we've done a lot of research in this safety space up to this point. So we had already been considering, you know, private security as a potential client. And so really what it came down to was, you know, we were trying to go for universities, municipalities, and private security companies. You know, yeah, we went to the money, but the money was our, led to our focus in private security. So really, the reason we made that transition was because, you know, shorter sales cycle, easier to get to decision makers, and the te technology we were building was already applicable to that industry. So we were able to not waste a bunch of time with, you know, f researching and doing the safety stuff by, you know, focusing on private security. And really, the beacon technology, what's great about it is it's so new uh, that, uh, and really the market is using them for, you know, uh, proximity-based marketing and things of that nature. So we entered this market and really it was just a result of uh, some of our client needs, you know, specifically in private security. They had patrol management uh, technology, just you know, RFIT, like touch tag systems and things of that nature, and we were able to replace that technology. So the, the beacons themselves, what's great about it is we became such experts, we're actually developing intellectual property based on uh, that core functionality. So we do have some things that we're working on that is, you know, IP for us and that will differentiate us in the market, so. Got a question here in the front. Hey, Jonathan, I'm Randon, I'm from Peoria. Thanks to Kaufman for having us. I just wondered if you could comment on your competition in this space. Uh, so the competition in the space is interesting. Obviously, mobile workforce management isn't a, very, isn't a new concept, so to say, there's been, you know, geolocation apps for a while and you know fleet tracking and things of that nature but I think our differentiator is our focus on proximity based you know interactions and actions so for instance you know like a home health care worker uh, you know they have to make sure that they do their patient logs you know in front of the patient right so there was an issue with fraud and you know doing those reports elsewhere so using this proximity based technology we can restrict that report to where they have to be standing in front of the person to actually complete that work task. Uh, you know, similar with private security, there may be an audit they have to do on a piece of equipment. We can restrict that to proximity. And what's great about this market and that I like is, you know, the proximity market is gravitating almost 99% towards proximity-based marketing. You know, walk into Macy's, it says, hey, John, welcome back, here's 10% off, you know, things of that nature. So we're really devi away, deviating away from that and like I said, we're able, you know, some of these unique installations that we're doing, we're learning a lot of, a lot of new things about this technology and we're able to develop intellectual property based on that, so. John, uh, one final question for sure. you and, and thanks so much for that explanation. But as a community, what can we do to help you? Uh, well, right now I would say we're definitely in scale up mode. You've seen the kind of sliding show up here. Uh, if anything caught your eye, or if you have a friend of a friend, or if you know someone who may see value in this technology, if you're curious about the technology, you know, we're looking for leads and new connections. Uh, you know, I will say that we focus on markets that, you know, we call them like low wage, high importance uh, employees. So keep that in mind. And also, if you're interested in beacon technology, if you've even heard of it, you know, just make sure to reach out. You know, that's something that I love. I'm kind of a beacon geek. so. I can talk about that kind of stuff all day. So really just I love connecting. I love finding new leads and generating new ideas. So as a community, just 
if you guys want to help out or if you guys want to connect, you know, just feel free. Thank you. Let's hear it for John. All right. So while we're bringing up chairs for the next folks, we're going to have a couple of quick announcements in between. First up is Andrea with Startup Grind. Andrea Esner. Sorry. Hello, I'm Andrea Esner, and this is actually my first One Million Cups, and somehow I ended up on the stage making an announcement, so thank you. Um, so I work for SEED, which is Center of Entrepreneurial Ecosystem Development, and next week we are hosting Startup Grind at Village Square Coworking Studio. Keith Moser will be talking from Flyover Capital. It's $10, but for everyone here today, there's a promo code 1MC, and tickets will be half price. We have food by Goodsons and beer, and it'll be a great conversation. So we'd love to see you out. Thanks. Thanks Thank you. That's a great event. All right, and next we have Bobby Birch. Sounds like you might have something that a few of the people in the audience might be interested in. Exactly. Is anybody a fan of the Kansas City Royals here, by chance? Yeah. OK, good, good. I was going to say. All right, well, uh, at Star I'm Bobby Birch, editor of Startland News, where Kansas City's only publication that's dedicated to covering exclusively uh, the entrepreneurial community here. Uh, we wanted to thank our readers by doing something that I think is pretty cool. Perhaps you've seen it on your chairs. Uh, we're giving away four free Royals tickets. So the only thing that you need to do is if you're not yet subscribed, go to startlandnews.com backslash royals, fill out that form, and you'll have a chance to win two Royals tickets. If you are already subscribed, send that link to a friend, uh, startlandnews.com backslash royals. And if they put your name in the referral box, you have a chance to win the tickets as well. So that ends at noon today. So you've got about two hours. So that's an eternity in the entrepreneurial world. It's for the Astros. So it's, I think they're two, the two different contests have two different games. So Thursday and Friday. So uh, yeah, two hours to, to win some Royals tickets. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Bobby. And I'm going to have you guys come on up here. I'll introduce you all in a second. Uh, in the meantime, if you are an, a One Million Cups organizer from out of town, could you do a quick just stand up? I'm going to start passing the mic around. You guys can introduce yourself. No, we're not going to do it. Thank you for being here. All right, gentlemen, you ready? <laughs> Uh, I think as Milton uh, mentioned at the beginning, uh, what, one of the things we've done here is the first Wednesday of every month we have Alumni Day, so obviously John was a previous presenter. Uh, these guys are also previous presenters. We like to have our alumni come back and talk to us about um, what's happened since they, were, since they were last here. So the first thing I'm going to have you guys do is tell us your name, your name of your company, and a little bit about kind of where you are right now, not how you got here yet, but, but where you are right now. So Vincent, why don't you start us off? Good morning, my name is Vincent Rodriguez. I own Velo Plus and Maps Coffee Roasters. Um, it's a unique business in that we are a full service and retail bike shop and service uh, shop, but also a coffee roastery. Um, I've spent 18 years with Starbucks and I did not want to walk away from my experience with Starbucks and coffee. Um, so I decided to open my own coffee company. So where I am now is um, we're doing some really great things. Um, I'm excited. I presented back in February or um, April. And uh, the coffee side of the business is growing. We have some key partnerships that we have here in Kansas City, well-loved uh, loved brands. Um, but um, things are great. Things are fantastic. Excellent. Thanks. Dwayne? Appreciate that. Uh, Dwayne Joseph, <clears throat> I own a company called Maranatha Ed. It's a um, ACT prep and in-home math tutoring business. And uh, we presented two years ago, next week would be two years that we presented here. It was a great experience because it allowed the community to know what we were doing. I used to work in this building for four years and I uh, eventually started my own company. Uh, so, uh, it's been going great. We, yeah, it's going on great. Yeah. <laughs> of course it's going great. Uh, so, are you mainly focused on, you said, ACT prep and in-home. Is it seasonal? Is that, uh, how, how are you, 
How does that kind of break down? Okay, so uh, in-home math tutoring is just my specialty and my, just my area. I was a uh, high school math teacher for 14 years in the classroom. And like I said, I worked in this building here for four years in the math department uh, in Kaufman Scholars and um, decided to go ahead and start my own business and focus mainly in math because we saw that uh, kids in our area was struggling in mathematics. So we, my staff and I go into the homes of the kids and we work with those kids in after school program pretty much. Uh, we work with homeschoolers also. And then the ACT prep part of the business is um, we realize, I realized that <clears throat> back in a few years ago, 10 by 10 years ago, that kids are really struggling with that also and decided to add that as part of my business. And we've seen a, a real surge in that area uh, in the last, about to say the last six months. Our kids are really scoring high. We're doing about between two to five point jumps when it comes to the ACT test. And it's basically my system that I'm using and um, working with the kids in repetition. So. so let's, we're talking, you've just talked about where you are right now. I wanna ask questions about, um, okay, so Vincent, when you were still working full time at some other place, yes. and you had this idea kicking around, it, like what was the spark? What was the thing where you said, now I'm gonna transition and do, do my own thing. So I'll answer that question, I'm gonna back up a little bit. So every year I have a goal to learn something new. A couple years ago was to spend the year learning how to make a bicycle. And so what that means is it's a um, hacksaw, hand file, truly handmade bicycle. I made 13 bikes that year in my garage. So August of that year, I said, you know, I gotta do something different. You know, it was at a point in my career where I needed something else, so I decided to leave Starbucks, crazy. Um, after all those years, and I felt that I wanted to bring an experience with bicycles and coffee that was unlike anything else um, I think anyone has seen before, especially here in Kansas City. Um, so I did, I left, and spent the better part of six months strategizing, researching, talking with people, and decided to open the shop in Lenexa, Kansas. And, um, you know, building bikes um, and having a retail shop, um, managing retail, is uh, a unique set of problems and, and uh, wins uh, unto itself. But then adding coffee to it, a, a roaster, which is what I call the test of coffee roasters in a bike shop, has gotten a lot of attention. And because of that, we've done some really cool things and created some great partnerships. So the impetus for me was I have felt compelled to do something different that was handmade, authentic, and most importantly, made in Kansas City. Dwayne, I'm gonna kinda ask you the same question. You said, you know, 14 years in the classroom, four years here with uh, K Scholars, and, you know, it, what, obviously you've, you've started a business that's in the same arc as the stuff that you were working on, but what was it that made you say, no, I'm gonna step out and do something on my own? You want honesty? I do. <laughs> we, <laughs> bring it, man. Um, so, uh, being here, we had a reorganization in our uh, offices here. And at that point, I decided that, you know what? I think I wanna just go ahead and do things on my own next time. <clears throat> so um, as a single father, my son and I sat down and we began to strategize how this can look. So we took our savings, some 401k, um, uh, yeah, we took that and we just decided to go ahead and start our own thing because I wanted to leave behind a legacy for my kids and not have them work constantly. So <clears throat> even in the process of this, my daughter who's 18 is, a, uh, is in college right now to be a high school math teacher and her goal is to come in and take over this company and, and go from there while I go ahead and take a look at some other endeavors that I wanna take a look at and which is um, the Joseph Foundation is something that I created that allows me to work with inner city families, students, and the elderly um, with, with different uh, educational goals. So, um, yeah, just going into that, that area there and trying to make sure that I wanted to leave something behind for my kiddos. And that's where it started. 
That's great. Thank you. So the section, the segment is called Tough Decisions because you have the decision to leave your full-time gig or, or, you know, what to do next, that kind of thing. But then also, over the last couple of years, what are, if you can identify a, a point, I mean, John uh, Ruiz earlier was talking about, you know, having to pivot a couple of different times. You've got, you've got tough, tough decisions there. So to, can you point to a certain thing? Because you're doing bikes, coffee, Maps and I think your website says and occasionally beer. Sometimes yeah. beer. So uh, yeah. yeah, you just um, add one thing every year. Like let's just I'm gonna figure out how to yeah. W wait till what's next. It's coming right. <laughs> um, you know, as we grow, we've been in the business on the bike side for two years, and as with any new business, you're still trying to find your fit, especially in the bicycle world. Bicycle world right now is high end bicycles. We sell steel bicycles because I make steel bicycles. So we had to differentiate ourselves um, as a retailer that we do things differently, but also make um, handmade frames. Uh, what we've done so well is educate our customer and invite them to come in as a community. So on Wednesday nights, we have open shop nights, and that's where you bring in your bike, you bring in a six pack of beer, park it in our strategic beer reserve, a AKA the beer fridge, and you can use our tools. And so we've, we've changed what I believe is the way that business is done in bike shops because we're, we're at where the customer or our cyclist is at, but also we're adding the benefit that we can add uh, a coffee experience. Um, we do occasionally brew our own beer, but we don't sell it. Actually, the coffee that we brew and give away in the shop, we don't sell that because we don't have a food service license. It's, it's a little complicated. Um, however, we are focused on a coffee roastery. So, um, so the tough decisions are is how do I move the business forward get the exposure that I'm looking for, have fun in what we're doing, uh, find a way to ride bikes and drink coffee. And uh, we do that every day when I show up. That's cool. Dwayne, can you point to anything that's, uh, I mean, or has it just been like, I had this idea and then it's been great, it's that, right? That's just the way it is, <laughs> man. Uh, honestly, it's uh, growing and some of the growing pains that you would have in uh, getting staff and hiring staff and then hiring people that are like me. So one of the one of the things that I, I encountered was I <laughs> I was sell I didn't sell my business, I sold me. And all of the all of my parents, they was like, oh my God, he's so great. I am. But he's so great. <laughs> yeah, you are. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and the thing about it is they wanted me to come to their kids' homes and tutor them. And then I found myself like I live down here on the plaza area. I found my, my office is 18th and Vine, and I find myself like all, all the way in north, the Northland, or one lady was Platte City, and I mean, I found myself all over the place, and I'm like, I can't, I'm tired. <laughs> so, I, so I have to figure out how not to sell me, but sell the business, and had to figure out how to find people that were like me, that had my like mind, that's, actually, that's gonna go out and hang out with the kids outside of what we're doing. One of the things that makes us who we are is that I realize that they don't wanna know how much you know until they know how much you care. And I can just about get a kid to do anything for me when they realize that I care for them. And that was always my motto as a classroom teacher. So being in this business, parents know that I care for them. I'm an advocate of a parent. I'm an advocate of the student. So if the parent has a meeting at the, at the, at the school, guess who's with them? I'm right there and I'm helping them out. So a lot of our business been really word of mouth and from this person to that person. And I'm telling you, it's been awesome. And <laughs> it's just been ridiculously awesome. And I'm trying to figure out how to add more staff and also um, just get people but the, the tough decision is getting people like me that's gonna that's gonna mirror what I do and who I am. Thanks, guys. We're gonna open it up for a few questions here for a few minutes. So if you have a question, raise your hand. I actually have a question for each of you. Dwayne, have you given consideration to looking at big brother, big sister volunteers to recruit from? I was, that's good, that's awesome. <laughs> they care. <laughs> they do. <laughs> um, that's awesome. Um, for the way our business model is set up, I like to use paid people 
because my volunteers are, you know, something may come up and then I have a kid hanging or a parent hanging. So I like to use paid people, but what I am looking at when it comes to the Joseph Foundation and what we have going on, uh, our next phase of what we have going on, Big Brothers and Big Sisters has been uh, a question, I would say, on the table for us to bring in those guys to help us with this particular project that we're looking at. I, w I would think Big Brother, Big Sisters would be a, a, a pool from which you could recruit for a paid position. That was yeah. my thought. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. I like yeah. that. Huh. <laughs> they oh, might like hey. your story. <laughs> uh, and then, Vincent, have you given consideration or are you already doing? Are you actually delivering coffee to your clients on your bikes? Not yet. Uh, <laughs> and that is a plan. That's a part of the strategy, certainly, as we live both bikes, coffee. Um, but we're working on that. Uh, obviously, I have to build the bike that we deliver the coffee to, so eventually, yeah. Got a quick question here on your right. <clears throat> um, can you talk about any of the local resources you guys may have used or may currently be involved in um, and how that's helped you make tough decisions? Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm an educator. I don't know a lot about business. So what I've decided to do is surround myself around people who know business, um, get mentored by those that can help me understand and navigate through those situations. So um, the small business development here in Kansas City with UMKC has been a great help. Mark Allen has been a great mentor of mine. And any decision that I would try to make, I would bring that before him and get some advice on it. I also have some mentors that are really not in the city itself that I looked up to as educators that can actually help me. So any area that I'm looking at, I try to find those people that can help me become what I need to become. Uh, so the UMKC uh, Small Business Development has been a great help. Uh, Black Economic Union of Greater Kansas City has also helped out. They helped sponsor my, my uh, my nonprofit organization until my nonprofit status gets in. So it's just been a great uh, group of people that I've surrounded myself around that can actually help me with those decisions that I do need to make, especially if I don't know, you know, what's a balance sheet and all that good stuff. <laughs> so thank you. The way that I would answer that, Ben, is um, certainly, you know, making connections with a lot of people. So showing up every Wednesday here has been beneficial, but making connections and asking for help, uh, but also getting out there and applying for things that, um, that will help me get exposure and some coaching and, uh, that I need. One of them being Scale Up Program, which is the KC Source Link uh, program that I've been a part of here for the last couple months. Um, and if you're unfamiliar with it, it's uh, part uh, growth venture, but also part uh, business education. Uh, to help our businesses get to a million dollars in revenue. And um, I'm one of 17 cohorts that have gone through the second phase of this, and it's been fantastic. It's a lot of homework. Uh, but I really enjoy the opportunity to have guest speakers come in and tell us about their business, their world. Um, and it's a small, really intimate uh, conversations about, here's where we were at, this is what we've done, this is how we get where we're going, this is how we can help you. Um, so, um, yeah, so certainly every, anyone that... Uh, that I can get in front of, certainly I would like to help, um, and then you know, ask him for help as well. Question up front here on the left. Mr. Joseph, I congratulate you on your business. Have you ever thought about maybe working with retired teachers who are limited in the number of hours they can work when they come back to the classroom, or with Teach for America personnel who sometimes leave teaching to go back to other things but still have the passion to work with children, which would give them that ability to have that passion, but also be able to still work with children also? Well, uh, for the retired teachers, I have two on my staff right now. That helps out a lot. Um, I kind of look for those guys that are in that area where they can, they've had that experience and they do care for, for the kids. Some of them have, and they're, you know, have that mindset that I do have. When it comes to Teach for America, I have not thought about that yet. And maybe something that you can probably help me with if that's something that you are experienced with or know or you know how to connect me. Um, so uh, right, like I said, right now we are in the hiring phase and just go on our, our website and you can look under careers and 
there's some ACT prep instructors that we're looking for right now. So if there's anyone that know of people that are in education that has a passion for kids, just let me know. I'll train you. I can train you to be awesome like me. It's just, I can do that. I'm just joking, guys. I'm just joking. Y'all probably like, he's so arrogant. Look at him. Hey, guys. Uh, thank you so much for sharing with us this morning. Um, we've got to actually cut it out early today, so hopefully we just leave everybody wanting more for next week. So, so I want to Close us up. Thanks again, Dwayne and Vincent. Let's hear it for these guys sharing their story with us. Um, guys, you. stick around. If anybody has any other questions for you, I'd like for them to be able to, to grab you. Um, for all the visiting organizers, we've got a buffet set up, and you've got a, your next meeting right outside this door. So right when we're done, just go ahead and exit and get started through that line, OK? And everybody else, sorry we can't feed you. Um, <laughs> You know, we're on a budget, so, uh, but thank you for coming, and have a great morning. We'll see you again next week.